Paul. Yes, sir. Sure. Good evening, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We are talking microbrews, the servers, ransomware, LLMs, and cybersecurity here at MWISE. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with John Furrier for what has just been a thrilling and educational day. day. I mean, AI technologies are here, people are trying to harness them for operational benefits, but the security challenge is still very high. It's a high bar and a lot of great tactics. And, and I won't say caution, I'm just saying pragmatic caution around uh, using Gen AI with humans in the loop for security. This next one will be great because threat intelligence and you should that automation will be great. I know, I'm, I'm super excited. We've got an expert in the house. Please welcome Charles. Charles, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks so much for having me, excited to be here. I got to say, your energy when you walked up here is exactly what everybody needs at 5 p.m. You are I, still serving, I love I, it. You know, this is the peak time for us to have these conversations. You know, right at the end of the day, everyone's tired and this is where we got to get right down to it. What matters, how can we make it better? Right? Yes, I love that. Well, speaking of, you just gave a presentation this afternoon before joining us. Can you give us some of the highlights? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about serverless security. What can, what can we do to help protect serverless environments from threat actors? How are threat actors targeting cloud environments and what are they doing once they're there? And what can we do to make ourselves more secure as organizations? What's the progression of serverless? Because everyone that you see, like Databricks of the world, they go in all serverless. Is that an opportunity for the threat actors or is it more of a challenge? What does that, that, that shift do on the infrastructure side uh, for the actors? Well, it's kind of interesting because from a threat actor perspective, we're not seeing a ton of activity here just yet, but we have started to see them looking at this space as a potential avenue for exploitation. Realistically, it's tougher to get into serverless environments in some ways because it's just not as common. It's not something that they use as often, but we have historically seen examples of threat actors wrapping traditional malware in a way so it could be taken advantage of in a serverless environment. And the risk to organizations is this might not be somewhere they're looking. They may not have defenses in place like they do for other parts of their cloud environment. And so the concern for me is, if you're not looking for it, if you don't have that visibility or that detection in place, how are you going to know if something's happening? And so my big you're point not. is, like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I want people to really start looking at this and understanding threat actors know this is a potential vector and they're potentially going to take advantage of it in the future. Absolutely, is the, is the security approach similar to serverless from a fundamental perspective or is it dramatically different than when we're securing other avenues of our business? I think a little bit of both. I think in some ways it's similar. The, the, the key concepts of identity access management and making sure that you have permissioning and configuration in place is the same as what we see in other parts of cloud environments. But from serverless, a key component here is scalability from compute resources can be very, very sudden and dramatic. And we can see that a an infection can go from a small thing to a huge thing much faster than potential other parts of cloud environments. Especially right now. Exactly. So yeah. scaling up can be for the good guys and the bad guys. Exactly. The, the benefit of serverless is that you can scale up very quickly and you can abstract away a lot of the risk, but the downside to that scaling capability is that threat actors also get it if they get in. What's the, what are some of the challenges you're seeing that people are starting to pay attention to? What were some of the questions you got in your talk and what are some of the questions you get a lot around this area? I think one great question I had was around if we're going to start seeing threat actors taking advantage of cloud infrastructure, of, I'm sorry, of serverless infrastructure to start exfiltrating information rather than encrypting it. Um, I think there's been a big trend in the overall threat actor environment where rather than engaging in encryption activities, now they're starting to realize that it's easier to take data out and then sell that back to the organization rather than trying to encrypt stuff. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It turns out encryption's kind of tough, right? Uh, turns, and also, decryption is very challenging. Right. And so you run this issue as a threat actor, should I do an encryption effort and then have to make a decryptor and then have to sell it back to them and they may not want to buy it? That's a lot of work. Or yeah. should I take all their data and then say I'm going to post this on the internet? Yeah. That's super easy. Yeah. That takes, you know, a quick tweet and you're done. Yeah. Right. And the salesman is like, hey, that cuts into our margin. Yeah. yeah I and mean, that's what it's like. And it's that's not totally. public, right? It's not something that, where margins. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it immediately escalates, right? You don't yeah. have to worry about the CEO hearing about it because they'll hear about it. Yeah. And so your chances of getting paid way higher. So from a threat act perspective, why would I waste all my time with this encryption stuff? when I could just steal the stuff and call it a day. So I think that trend will be a really interesting one to watch over time. How is it impacting the ecosystem? Because we've been having a lot of talks about um, uh, what's behind the API, what's behind the SaaS vendor, he might have multiple third parties. So third party integration, big part of cloud, serverless stuff obviously there too. You start to see that crossover. How do you look at that, that kind of space? I think to me there's two key concepts here, compliance and collaboration. When it comes down to it, we need to make sure that 
organizations have a strong compliance regime in place because while compute scales, compliance doesn't. Right. Right. It, just because you can do things faster and easier doesn't mean that your compliance capabilities for having multiple things hosted in serverless architectures is going to be able to scale in the same way. You can't just throw more bodies at that problem. Right. Um, so I think that's going to be an increasing challenge for organizations. I also think cooperation is a key element here because a key a visibility gap that comes up a lot of times is you have the cloud provider and you have the organization that's that's doing stuff, and if they're both not if they both think the other one's taking care of it, no one's actually looking. And so I think that making sure that you're constantly having that interaction between your provider and your client and making sure they're working together to be collaborative in their visibility posture is what you're going to need to be able to be effective. Absolutely. That communication is actually, you know, it's nice. I mean, we work in a very technical world. Everyone likes to talk about the, the tech specs and the nerdy bits and, and the stacks, but the communication here is actually so mission critical. Right. If no one's communicating about what's going on and everyone assumes it's fine, it's probably not fine. Right. One, visibility is challenging, right? Because you don't yeah. know what you don't know. It's, it's a classic unknown unknown. So right. I think that's something that we're trying to really hammer on is that as as you get to use cloud environments more, as you use these different capabilities, addressing those unknown unknowns and trying to find out where they are rather than just hoping that they don't bother you is what we have to do. We can't just you know close our eyes, hope it goes away. That's not going to work. How does <laughs> but it, it feels so easy to do that so, sometimes. So much easier. Oh, I dream dream <laughs> but also, how does the, the observability space, which has been heavily overfunded with cloud native, now that as you get into security, checking out these interconnected serverless systems, becomes an observability kind of frame, but also networking. So the networking layer, how do you look at that piece? Because again, if you can talk serverless, you're talking about storage compute networking, working together, as things are interconnected. Yeah. And you get the third party, so you got observability challenges or evolution and kind of bubble popping in some areas, but, and then the network side, yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I think the big challenge here is it really is an organization by organization basis, right? There's so much, there's so many details on how an organization functions from a large org to a small org on what's going to be feasible for them, whether it makes more sense for them to use observability from a third party, you know, really leverage additional resources from an external vendor, or if they have those resources internally, how they can most effectively and efficiently use those resources to achieve observability in a, in a manner that's cost effective. Uh, it's it's just so tough because it's tough for me to give a good blanket answer here okay. because each case is so different. Well, I think that's one of the bigger challenges though in general with cybersecurity is they are all different. Yeah. You know, if it was easy, we wouldn't have any issues. Yeah, if it was, I'd just set up a booth out here and call it a day, right? And make my millions of dollars and go home. Yeah, I'm curious. So we're talking a lot about culture and communication and collaboration, particularly, yeah. I mean, obviously essential in the cybersecurity community. You've worked at some interesting places in your history. You've got history on the consulting side with Deloitte. You've been with the NSA. You're now at Google. If you're allowed to speak about it, how is the Google cybersecurity culture, and is it different than some of the more private or, or government-owned uh, bodies that you've worked with in the past? That's a great question. I think Google's got a really amazing uh, security and privacy-first culture when it comes to approaching things. I've, I've been very impressed, and I, I say this to my colleagues all the time, that I think Google really takes itself seriously when it comes to security and privacy for its users and for, uh, for its different capabilities, because it wants to be the best in the market. It wants to be the absolute pinnacle of privacy and security, I think, and I think they're doing a great job of it. I think from a cultural perspective, yeah. that's really what they're aiming to achieve, and I think they're doing a great job of it. It's very fundamental to it. Uh, it's tough for me to compare to other organizations because, uh, you know, my other organizations didn't have as much uh, resources or drive in the same way that, um, yeah. that this one does. Talk about the scale, the scale aspect of Google because um, we had multiple CISO, office of CISO execs in. Scale comes up as a big thing you're dealing with. Yeah. And then you have all these new things coming in which some of the channels are in. They don't have the scale, but they want to leverage new technologies. You guys have the benefit of scale and a diverse user base and application environment. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think Google is both fundamentally focused on scale, right, which is great. We, we as a company, understand that problems aren't just going to affect one or two people. When we change things, it affects millions. And so we are always focused on how can we scale this out, not just for a, an edge case, but for as many people as possible. For organizations, I think the challenge of scale is going to be a continually large one. I mean, I talked a moment ago about how comp scaling compliance is going to be challenging. Uh, the way we approach it is a lot through automation and using technologies, emerging technologies, uh, especially things like AI and LLMs, to figure out how we can most effectively scale out capabilities in a way that it's not just a matter of more people and seats, yeah. but are actually using technology to make things better. You know, it's interesting, Charles, is when you talk, I, I start thinking about the heterogeneous nature of even cloud straight up pure cloud, but as you get distributed computing with edge and other things, data has to be harmonized, 
all kinds of factors come in, the complexity increases, but now new opportunities are there to abstract that away. So yeah. we're kind of in a cool environment for that. As, as you look at that piece, what are some of the things customers are dealing with it that you talk to and Google too, around, okay, we want to go as fast as we can, kind of let the chaos reign and then reign in the chaos uh, in, a, in a way that's responsible. How would, you, how would you answer that or talk about that? Well, I think one thing that, um, going back to the serverless component here, part of this idea of serverless is that if, I, if I'm an organization and I really want to get this application, I want to be able to go up and running at full speed, full tilt, whenever I need it, this is where serverless thrives. The whole point is for you to put your application onto, some, onto a serverless architecture and then abstract away all the infrastructure underlying it. And then you can go at full tilt. And the advantage of cloud providers is they provide this capability for organizations that may not want to have, can't stand up all these capabilities on their own, but can take advantage of these underlying defenses that the cloud, cloud provider natively hangs. My next question on that thread is, okay, now one of the things we're taking out of this show on day one, at least for me, is the connecting the dot that Gen AI is just an application security problem. And the data underneath it, whether it's a gent agents or whatever, is part of the data layer which runs on the infrastructure, okay? Mm -hmm. So you have these teams coming together. There seems to be a gap, I reported in today when I research note, the gap between security teams and data teams. Traditionally, the data teams were data scientists. Now they're involved, now you got data engineering kind of going on with the cloud, then you got pure infrastructure folks, like serverless going, hey, I'm going to scale up stuff, that's what I do, mm -hmm. I'm done, or it's not done, it's connected. So as the teams come together, yeah. any thoughts um, uh, that you share around what you see as gaps, and what people are doing to be successful to bring that nexus of skill set, uh, platforms, um, code. Yeah, so I'll say, you know, my background is threat intelligence. I'm a threat intelligence guy through and through. And when, it comes to, when you're thinking about threat intelligence and how to best protect an organization proactively, the number one thing you need is data. Data that's accessible, usable, and malleable so that you can best understand what the threat landscape looks like for your organization. And to your point, right now we are in an ama interesting, amazing era where there's a lot of different data sources from, from the cloud, from cloud provider, from your internal logging systems, from different telemetry sources. There's all sorts of different data sources that you can leverage and pull in, and it's a very noisy and complex environment yeah, to use. Yeah. But it's also beautiful because you can use all that data and if you can craft it and find a way to wrangle all that data effectively, we have more capability to understand what's happening and more ability to protect ourselves today, I think, than we ever have. And one quick follow-up, please. I'll pass this one. That's cool. What data, sources, what data <laughs> sources do you see now that are available and gettable and attainable <laughs> that you're using that weren't available kind of just maybe a few years ago? Yeah. <laughs> The threat that's, hunter. That's a great question. I, uh, I'm a little reticent to answer only because my um, my deep seated fear of, re re uh, of revealing sources and methods. So I, I don't want to get into that in too much detail. The answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> there's, some, there's some great data. I would love to tell you more, but uh, I can't answer that so question. Answer, but there is probably. I mean, there, there are new ways. Probably. There are, new, there are new forms of data. While well, there's new data being generated, and we're doing a much better job as an industry, I yeah. think, of collating and collecting that data yeah. and making it more accessible yeah. in a different way. Good answer, by the way. Yeah. Very. very Check your sources. Very, 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 we respect that. No, absolutely, thank very, you. Very diplomatic there. Your enthusiasm is, is encouraging me to take this conversation in a slightly different direction. So let's say someone is listening right now, they're curious about cybersecurity, you said you're a threat intelligence through and through. Yes. What's your advice to someone curious about getting into our industry? I love this question. Uh, well, I'll start with an easy one. Um, if you're a student and you're thinking about getting into it, I recommend checking out the National Science Foundation Cyber Cybersecurity Scholarship for Service program. It's what I did to get into cybersecurity when I graduated. It's through the National Science Foundation. They pay for a degree, either bachelor or graduate degree, in cybersecurity in exchange you work for the federal government for two years. It's a great way to easily and cheaply get a degree in this field, which a lot of people may not otherwise have access to. It's a very effective program. Check it out. NSF. SFS, I believe is the exact acronym. That's awesome, carry on. Otherwise, if you want to get into this field, there's so many different ways and so many different parts of cybersecurity. I think what I would recommend is take a step back and look at what area of cybersecurity are you really interested in? Do you want to be an instant responder? In which case, you should look into what does instant response look like? What is, how do you approach that? How can you, what coursework can you take? Or what studying can you do? Yeah. Do you want to be a SOC analyst? Do you want to be looking at alerts and really saying this is what matters and what doesn't? Do you want to be a threat intelligence analyst? Do you want to be looking at what's 
the cutting edge? What are they doing on dark webs, on dark web investigations? And what are threat actors doing? What are criminals up to? You know, there's so many different avenues. You know, people say, how do I get into cybersecurity? But the real question is, what do you want to get into in cybersecurity? Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge world. So on that point, because this is very broad, the aperture is getting bigger and bigger. Is there intrinsic skills that someone might have, not degrees, intrinsic skills? And I'm tall enough to play basketball, I can, I can learn, right? So, but if I'm not, I can learn about it, but I can't play. That's an old, old adage. Every job you just listed has an intrinsic, you know, superpower. Yeah. Share your thoughts on those different intrinsic capabilities. Yeah, great question. I think um, I'm actually going to shift it a bit and say that I think that almost any set of skills would fit into a, some part of the cybersecurity landscape. Are you super detail oriented? Then you would probably be great at looking at packets in a SOC, as a SOC analyst. Are you super curious and you love diving deep into something? And if you see some, a thread that can be pulled, you'll pull it. You'd probably be a great threat intel analyst. Are you somebody who you know really just likes talking to people, like myself? Well, I bet you'd be great at briefing boards or briefing uh, CISOs on what's going on. And that's a critical skill, having that communication ability. There's so many different yeah. ways to get into cybersecurity. So I don't think there's any one skill that you need. I think I would flip it the other way around and yeah. say, what's skills do you have or what, what would you say are your intrinsic values? And then where does that map most effectively into a cybersecurity profession? That's so one thing, the one thing that I would say is common between all of our guests and all of our cybersecurity conversations, passion. I think yeah. in this industry in particular, yeah. you got to want to wake up and fight the good fight and really care about it because it's always out there. There's always going to be bad actors trying to I, harm us. And it's always changing, which I think the reason I love cybersecurity is because it's always different. Yeah. Four years ago, people were saying, oh, I think ransomware might be going away, I guess. And then it came back with obvious resurgence. You know, six years ago, they were talking about crypto miners and how big that was going to be. And then that's never really blown up just yet. But t over time, you see these trends, and these changes yeah. in the cybersecurity landscape. And they just keep shifting and moving. And I think that constant freshness and novelty makes cybersecurity a really interesting field to be in. I couldn't agree more. It's why we love our jobs. So, and we're here. So Kevin Mandy has said on the keynote what board and execs want, since you do a lot of board briefings. He said maturity, maturity models, size and resources available, industry kind of dynamics, industry threads that are going on, threats, I meant trust and reputation, and then leadership at board risk profile. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction to that? What do you see in terms of as you start to see, you know, people go clamping down, obviously it's a board level conversation, but like now it's like bottoms up, top down coming together. Well, I mean, far be it for me to say, uh, Kim and Mandy is not absolutely right in everything he says. He's, I think, I thought his presentation was great this morning. I thought it was one of the highlights of the day and I thought it was very, very accurate and skilled. So I'm not going to say yeah. that anything he said was, was yeah, incorrect. I'll simply, right on. I'll simply try to, uh, to add to, to his good thoughts here and say that um, I think boards are really interested in understanding What's the risk? What's the potential impact? How are we going to effectively address the risk? And what is the risk? And that's a really tough question to answer for uh, yeah. uh, cybersecurity professionals because risk traditionally is what is the probability of impact yeah. and what's the cost of impact? But we're yeah. not great at answering yeah. either of those questions, right? Yeah. That's a, if, yeah. that's another one of those questions. If I could do it, I'd set up a booth, make my millions. And <laughs> well, his talking about accepting risk was, I thought, very provocative because it opens up the, the door to saying, okay, what, who accepts the risk and what is that risk and how does that translate to cyber? Yeah. And it's multiple risks. And if you don't, if you can't affect change, See, it's a whole open question. Yeah. I actually really liked it because I think what or is, I think what organizations may have a tendency to do is rather than having somebody accept the risk, specifically a person accept the risk, if they just say, well, the organization accepts the risk, they can't, they're not going to have somebody who's accountable over time as the landscape constantly changes to step back and say, are we still okay with this? Right. Is it still has our have we changed? Has the landscape changed? Has the general geopolitical environment changed? Right. To an extent that we uh, we no longer want to accept this. It's too easy to become complacent if there isn't somebody who says, you know, this is your job. Right. Yeah, and their job depends on it. Yeah. When the breach, I was like, well, that wasn't my job. Yeah, it, to your point about change. Oh, yeah. Huge. I, I, but I did appreciate Kevin Mandia saying this wasn't somebody who you point to to crucify. Yeah. This is somebody who you no. point to to accept the risk so that they're making an informed decision. And I understand. thought that was really fair. Yeah. yeah, no, I think I think that is it. It's not, we're not here to point fingers. We're here right. to understand the, the level of complexity of these risks and actually own that rather right. than. It's, it's too complicated. The risks is complicated and it's changing. It's ever changing. And that's, yeah. that's a big challenge, I think. Yes. Yeah, so you talked about some fun myths in the space or patterns we've seen or things that have happened that haven't quite happened. Crypto mining, ransomware coming back. What do you think is the most overhyped thing in cybersecurity right now? Overhyped? Well, that's a good question. I don't really have a good answer for it. I mean, I think that um, 
I think there's, I think we're in a pretty good spot right now in cybersecurity where I think we have a good sense of the major risks. I honestly think the biggest thing we're doing is we're missing things that could be bigger risks in the future. Ooh. I, so, for example, okay. I went to a great talk today on hacktivism and the way that's evolved over time. Yeah. And I thought that talk really highlighted this group that I think most people just don't think about. We think about um, cyber criminals, we think about advanced persistent threat actors, state actors, and then we maybe think about hacktivists, I guess, a lot, but I mean, yeah. they're usually at the bottom of the list after like our, you know, our pets, right? You know, and we're like, no one thinks about it. Unless Anonymous is doing something interesting exactly. that's got everyone's attention. That, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is something that headlines. Yeah. But then, but then we also tend to say if it's a hacktivist doing something interesting, well, it's probably just a false front for a state actor, right? You know, that's, we tend to, we tend to dismiss things or even crypto mining. I think we dismiss crypto mining too easily and say, well, it's not that big of a deal, even though it could in fact just be covering up other malicious activity that, uh, that the threat actor is trying to hide behind this crypto mining guys. So I would say rather than seeing things that are overhyped, I think there's more stuff that's underhyped that needs more yeah. consideration by organizations. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Charles, this has been thrilling. Heck, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We needed you on the stage this time of day. This is great. You're welcome back 5 p.m. anytime. We're on I, any show floor. I'm happy to be the happy hour talker anytime. <laughs> <laughs> we will doing. make sure, though, that we've got some good four columns beer on the, on the set for you. Yeah, that would be excellent. Thank you so much. As well, no, I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. John, fantastic. No thread as always, and thank all of you fabulous security community for tuning in to our full first day of coverage here at MYS in Denver, Colorado. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news. Yeah.